Hi. I think you're going to be quite a tough crowd. And I, I'm, I'm not going to talk about typefaces, but I've got a graphic designer joke. I'm a trainer. So go easy. So I'm just going to say a little bit about uh, ISOBI in case you haven't heard about us, but not too much selling. Um, our mission is, as it says on here, to transform businesses, brands, and people's lives with the creative use of digital. Yes, we're the digital guys. Um, we're global. We're in 85 countries, 45 offices, sorry, 85 offices, uh, 45 countries, and we've got a really nice spread across the world. And actually, we have a lot of cross-fertilization between those various offices, between centers of excellence, but also kind of cultural programs to kind of make sure we are kind of staying at the very forefront of what we're doing. And we work across these four key areas. So Marcom's ecosystems, which I am fond of saying is a posh word for a website, a kiosk, and mobile phone app. Digital products and services where existing brands like to widen their offer by kind of uh, growing out this way. And a new service around transformational consulting because as much as everyone talks about transformation, uh, people do need it. And we're also helping a lot of businesses try and make sense of what they need to be transforming in the first instance. As you might expect, we have a multidisciplinary team. No great surprises there. But we have been pushing very much around kind of innovation. And one of the things that we have kind of, if you like, discovered and tried to make more sense of is this diagram, is that innovation has been very much a hot topic for some time. But actually, innovation can be applied in a number of different ways. And it's contextual to you and what you're doing, but also your sector and your category. But I really like the way that we're kind of showing here that actually transformation, in most cases, is new solutions for new markets. And the thing that we hear a lot about, which is driven by Silicon Valley, is the model of disruption, which is a new solution for an existing market. And it's really useful to kind of break this down and have an appreciation of what you're trying to achieve in quite simple language. Are you wanting to do something new for a new market? Or are you needing to do something new for your existing market to kind of stay relevant? And actually, is it disruption that you really need to do that? So I want to say a few words about kind of how we feel that the role of brands is changing. So not surprisingly, and we heard at the panel that uh, you know, brands need to be more than this kind of image, this superficial 2D layer that you wrap around your entity. You know, today, brands have got to be much more than what, than what they say. They kind of need to be what they do. And actually, the brand is not what we as experts say. It's what the kind of public and the consumers think of that particular brand. And it's very much and has always been that battle of the mind. But it's far more richer and complicated and multidimensional now. And this is really brought out in this talk by uh, Professor Scott Galloway, who some of you may know of. Um, he did a talk here, The Death of the Industrial Advertising Complex. So anyone who works in advertising should really view this, and if you don't, maybe you might smile. Um, but what he points out is that brands, and we, I think we fetishized brands and the whole idea of branding, and we sort of, in many ways, lost kind of context of what brands are for. And brands were really connecting between customers' desires and finding the right product or service. But technology and, and connected technologies that have been driven by the internet have also started to provide us other ways to span the chasm. So Amazon, reviews, services like TripAdvisor, and of course, search engines like Google are helping us try and find a thing that we want. So that brand is having to fight against those. So you might say branding is not so important. I believe that it's never been more important, but it needs to be applied in the right way. Other things that are happening, which is really hastening this change and this need for digital transformation and the importance of experiences, is this chart. So you can see the blue one there. It's very much looking like an S-chart, an S-curve, and that is smartphones. So it's almost impossible to have more smartphones than internet connections, and we know how uh, transformative the internet's been. And actually, if you think about smartphones, it's changed pretty much every aspect of our life. This, uh, there's an interesting group in this room of people that have dated without mobile phones and then the group that have dated with the mobile phones. And we laugh, but actually it's, it kind of demonstrates about how much have changed. And that gives rise to this almost demand-led thinking. We heard the reference to Uber earlier, and I think it's really, we shouldn't underestimate how this has changed. But you'll see at the bottom, e-commerce is quite low. What's going to fill that gap? You know, is e-commerce going to rise? We're seeing kind of Apple get more into services. And so the betting here is that simply we need to double down on that experience that you're uh, achieving and really kind of play into a consumer's lives. So we would state quite simply that experience is the new battle uh, battleground for brands. 
I've crossed out brands, not because I'm anti-brand, but also I think that when you have a conversation about brands, pe business people often have a perception about brands which is something which is a bit, that's what the marketing is, a bit soft and fluffy. But actually we know branding is intrinsically linked to the success of business. And actually, we need to talk more about business. It's business. It's about being a good business, it's about making good business, it's about growing the business. And the brand is integral to that, and let's not separate that out. But the chart here on the right-hand side is quite simple. Companies now create customers that build brands that sustain companies. Now, if you were schooled in the art of Procter & Gamble, of Reckitt Benkheiser, of Unilever, you would probably see this as being companies create brands that build customers. But I think there's a lot of evidence that points to the fact that new companies are going out there, usually and often empowered by a smartphone application, to find an audience, to work with them, to build a service, to get great product market fit, and then together build that brand. And then actually use paid media advertising to you and me to then scale that brand. And I think it's quite important to challenge yourself to think about how this comes across. And you might feel that it should be companies create communities, and you'd have a valid point. So for us, we see things are changing, and technology has uh, really precipitated this. It's driven a change in our behaviors. So often we, brands want you to be the authority. Now they have to be far more authentic. Everyone talks about storytelling. I prefer to think about a story framing, in which you frame the story, you tell some of that story, and invite your audience in to join you as part of it. They can observe from the sidelines, they can get fully immersed, or they can kind of dip in this. But actually, it kind of unlocks a lot of opportunities, and we'll start to see more with immersive media that really plays to that. But it's been witnessed, I think, in the last 10 to 15 years in social media. Also, punishment to protection. Um, I have an interesting story about made.com, which I won't go into any too much detail, but they'll happily send you an email every day trying to sell you something. But the one time you really need to get an email from them about your delivery and your delayed order, they don't bother. Uh, so, which is pretty shit, right? And it's a good example about how brands, is anyone here from made.com? Please say yes. <laughs> it's a great example about how we often kind of look to behave in what we feel is the right way, but don't always follow it through. And there's an arbitrage there, actually. I'm sure some, in this instance, someone's done the calculation. It's easy to get a new customer versus the people that will then cancel their order. Um, but we shouldn't be like that. It should actually be very much focused on the customers and actually making sure that we're matching their expectations. This has led us to a series of kind of things that we kind of try and prescribe to. I'm not going to go, though, go through these, but you get a sense of actually how it should be more seamless, looking at frictionless commerce, be far more integrated, the smart use of data, actually doing good. And we feel this is a way for businesses to thrive. And when we talk about experience-led transformation, for us, what we're saying is if you start with the experience your customers are having, whether that's in a consumer world or a business world, and then ask, how can I meet those expectations, this will filter back into your business. And that's the notion of being experience-led. Because you will start to find that potentially your supply chain or your organizational structure or who you're partnering with is not allowing you to do that. And actually, that's quite radical. How well everyone's doing with it, let's see. But that's what we mean by experience-led transformation. And we believe it's because we have to make sure that we're working with our clients to meet their customers' expectations, which has been driven predominantly by technology in our overly connected world. So I'm not going to say any more about that. I'm going to show you, and I'm going to do it through the vehicle of fried chicken. Yeah, warming up's good. I'm talking about KFC, of course, and I'm talking specifically about KFC in China. As you can see there on the slide, they'd been in uh, China for 28 years. They were very much kind of losing their image, and they needed to do something about it. So we really helped them transform. So a 1,000 days later, and over 100 projects that had been delivered, we were able to put up some pretty impressive numbers. Um, so when we talk about things like CRM, we feel pretty confident, right? So but it's worth noting is that in China, niche is mass. So actually, if you were to take the number of millennials, it would be the world's fifth largest country. So you are, are able to kind of carve out and have quite distinct communications and services that were really engaged, in this instance, re-engaged that audience. And the Chinese millennial is an interesting uh, kind of being. They've very much grown up with technology and often, we would say, te technology-obsessed. They see eating as a trendy social experience. 
They love tech, and also they're very proud to be Chinese, and they very kind of sit by into this idea of things with purpose. So this was a great kind of audience, and actually is important to try to challenge your preconceptions about what they were wanting to see and hear. I've got a clip and show you some of the work that we did. <laughs> An awful lot of work went into that, a uh, lot of technology, and as you can see, a lot of activations to kind of help drive those sales. But when we were looking and had that initial question about how can we transform, it's kind of lost its cool image, what we found was that people just didn't like queuing. They didn't like queuing in the restaurant, the ordering process was really naff, and that just people just wouldn't bother to go in. So actually, if you were able to address that kind of key friction point, you could then start to kind of change things around. So we really kind of took, uh, worked with Gusto on this, and I'm going to talk you through a number of things that we did to address that. We implemented and upgraded the super app. So in China, everything, a lot of things are based on WeChat, and these are a good way to think about it. It's like a mini web website within WeChat that actually allows you to then access and know lots of kind of related and connected services, and actually we were able to drive up to 120 million memberships through that program, which is pretty impressive, and that became the linchpin and the key conduit for the communications that we had. Not surprisingly, we improved the ordering process, and just quite simply by being far clean, uh, cleaner in terms of the design, clearer about what was in there, but also just better quality kind of imagery around the food that you were going to eat to make that food feel far more kind of tasty and delicious. Uh, In-store ordering as well, we'll see the screens. These are in obviously in other um, kind of Western quick serve restaurants. Um, but this, is, again, was a demonstrable uh, approach to reducing the amount of time it would take to order, but also improving the experience when you were, in fact, queuing. But when you've got that technology in place, it starts to allow you to do some interesting things. So we would encourage people to order their breakfasts, yes, I know, uh, the night before, which has some good business implications. But also, given that there was a lot of KFCs by the major train stations, we were also able to do experiments and offer the kind of promotions here is actually getting your KFC ordered and delivered to your uh, train as you're communicating into work. But also, you, once you've done that, you can also start to branch out into smart TV, so you're experimenting with intelligent voice ordering, and actually that starts to demonstrate this is a progressive uh, brand, and actually, you know, hey, you don't even need to go to the store, you can just get it from your TV. Um, but also working with Alipay to pay with a smile. So this is obviously using facial recognition. I think most people in the West are slightly concerned about this. Um, uh, what I will say is it would scan your face and then you'd need to confirm it on your phone, right? But I think it also demonstrates anyone who's got the kind of Apple Face ID, it works particularly well and you kind of get used to it. But again, you know, it's about stripping out of friction and also kind of working with the way that people might kind of want to pay for things. Coffee ordering with Kiri, which you think of it as the uh, kind of Chinese version of Alexa or Siri. But again, that again, we're just making it easy. I think most people have a standard coffee order. So actually just being able to kind of say it to your phone and have it know it's been ordered kind of makes that much easier for you. You can just walk into the uh, kind of the KFC and pick it up. But also this experiment, and this isn't, this feels like a gimmick, but actually what this is is saying that with China is going on massive change. And what you're seeing essentially over the last 30, 40 years is a, a, essentially a rural country become a, an urban country. They've got 20 cities the size of London, 
if not bigger, and certainly kind of Shanghai and Beijing at kind of 20 million. But they also have 56 ethnic groups and 84 dialects. But when everyone comes to a city, they try to speak Mandarin. And so I have some empathy with this, with coming from Yorkshire to London. Is that you try and, oh, can I have a Coke? What? But when people try and order for their KFC, they're often kind of asked and prompted again. So the robot, the Dumi, Dumi robot, which is in partnership with Badu, would actually be smart enough to detect one of the kind of major dialects and then speak to you in your dialect and then talk you through, you place it on the clip, talk you through the menu, which again is just a lovely example of helping feel more at ease when they're ordering and actually turning what might be a painful experience into a delightful experience. And again, it wasn't just about the ordering, it was also when you're in the restaurant, let's kind of make that experience better. So K-Music was a great way of turning essentially the whole store into a giant jukebox. You might have seen on the clip, you're able to then kind of connect your phone to your table mat, and that allows you to select music, which is then queued on the jukebox. And again, actually has the opportunity to kind of create new media space by the amount of music that's going through it. So what this led was that Sign and News, which is one of the big kind of publishers, to actually talk about KFC in very glowing terms, and actually described them as a tech business, described as a check, you know, as it says, as a fried chicken business. Now that might sound a bit glib, but actually, if you're looking to IPO, and if you look at the stock market and you see which businesses have got the highest valuations, and this is very true for banking, is that those have got kind of powerful technology plays get a much higher valuation. So this demonstrates by thinking in this particular way is that we are able to drive real business value and growth creation around that. And it, you know, we sum this up by saying, look, you know, for us, and technology often gets a bad name, but we believe if used correctly, is able to liberate creative thinking. I'm very excited by that. And I, I know Barry, he's, a, he's an old friend, we've judged together. Um, and I would say that actually his comment about creativity usurps always uh, be AI, but actually what can we do with AI and the creatives working together? And actually I think that gives you a competitive advantage and that's the way that we should see it. Because the one thing about AI is it is artificial and it's got quite a long way to go. Um, so that's technology. So very quickly, I just wanted to try and bring it a bit closer to home. I've got three pieces of work that I'm gonna go through very quickly. The first is for Aston Villa. Um, I don't like the voiceover for this, it's a bit too congratulatory. Um, so, but what we've done with Aston Villa, just to show you uh, that um, you know, we can work in this sp space, is that we, one of the things we believe in is brand commerce. And brand commerce is very simple. It says that because of technology and media habits, points of inspiration have become much closer to points of commercial transaction. And so when you're browsing um, Instagram, for example, or YouTube, your next purchase is maybe only a few clicks away. And that kind of really changes the way that a lot of us has had to think about the pro role of brands and marketing communications. This work for Aston Villa was for their kit launch last summer. Um, and you would be able to kind of take it out as a guerrilla campaign, series of posters around Birmingham, and then prime their fans that this poster would be there. They were able to scan the poster, takes them to a mobile um, kind of microsite, tells them a little bit more about the kit, and the kit this instance was designed by a local designer, it had its own interesting story, and then you'd then be able to preview that using web AR, and then make the purchase, as you can see it kind of here. And, and it was very good, we sold eight weeks of stock in two weeks and 14 days, um, so kind of drove lots of traffic to that, and had a sales increase of 750%. Uh, and I think it's just a simple way of saying actually, What's that loyal fan base? What are they wanting? How can we kind of improve that rather than just selling to them? And actually, it was very good at communicating what the club was standing for and reminding them about what it meant to be a fan and the kind of rich history that they had. And again, you know, amazing sentiment. So the next piece of work is for Diageo. And apologies if you've seen this before. Um, but Diageo, as we know, make, make lots of booze, ship it to distributors, and then they sell it to kind of off-licenses or supermarkets. And one of the challenges that they have is that getting to know the customer. They have a website called The Bar. This is an attempt to kind of make people aware of all the various cocktail recipes and the sort of drinks that they serve. But they want you to say, look, how can we start to explore and think about how you know, the people's new behaviors are gonna change? So we went away and we built them, an in fact, we built them two Alexa skills. The first one was very much a prototype on a smart speaker. And the one I'm about to show you now is what we call multimodal voice. And so it was happening on an Alexa show. So you'll see the voice and screen working together. There's also, I think, quite a good joke at the end. 
The popularity of cocktails is rising. However, home consumption remains low. That's why Diageo created a cocktail skill on Amazon Alexa, so you can work on yours. From now on, just say, Alexa, open the bar. Welcome to the bar. With over 75 recipes, it can find you the perfect cocktail and tell you how to make it. Let's start with a classic. Old fashioned coming right up. Start with the sugar. Add ice. Pour in the whiskey. Stir patiently. Garnish with the orange zest. Cheers. The bar gives personal cocktail advice to suit your taste. Would you like something sweet or sour? Sweet. I got a great recipe for a espresso martini. This is how 007 would drink his coffee. The bar is enabled with commerce functionality, so you can get ingredients delivered at home. Just say the word. Just mix, shake, twist, strain, peel, flame, and serve. Boom. Look at you, Mr. Bartender. Your home is now a bar, and it's open. Alexa, I feel like a woo-woo. I got a great recipe for a woo-woo. It is a 70s disco-inspired drink that is sweet and fruity. That's the way. Aha, uh aha, -huh, uh -huh, you'll like it. Thank you. <laughs> but it also, I think, kind of demonstrates that um, with these voice assistants, actually being able to imbue them with a little bit of personality and also kind of anticipate how they maybe answer a question. I was at a talk last week, and you know, uh, you speak to Siri, you, you know, to speak to for any length of time, you'll get frustrated. But actually, if a Siri was going, mm, well, mm, I'm not so sure, uh, maybe, actually, you might think quite differently about that voice assistant as opposed to just shouting at it. Um, but again, this is a great way of understanding and experimenting with these kind of newer channels, but also thinking more holistically about the experience. And as part, of, and if you want to go home tonight and you've got a, a Amazon Alexa, just say, open the bar, and it will kind of trigger for you. Um, but this is also working without a beta version where um, you see, you put this on the clip, you can order the ingredients and they would be shipped to you, which actually for a business like Diageo is quite a, a big challenge or it's a kind of certainly a different approach to, from what they're used to. But again, it's saying, look, what's our customers doing? What are their expectations? And how can we continue to be relevant in their lives? So the last case study you'd be glad to know is for Volkswagen. And this was done by our kind of Dutch team. Um, and I think that a lot of work around uh, cars is all about the pre-sales, it's all about the test drive, it's all about making it kind of feel pretty kind of glamorous. Um, there's a lot of data that suggests that if you have a good driving experience, you're likely to come back uh, and kind of uh, stick with that brand, um, certainly if you kind of have, uh, have no problems getting it serviced. But one of the things you'll notice, and anyone who's kind of got kids, I think, will kind of relate to this, is that uh, our, the way that we behave in the car has changed, and technology, in this instance, for the worse, has perhaps changed that. So this is a piece of work that we did with Volkswagen in Holland. Uh, it's called Road Tales, and I'll let it play. Thank you. Once upon a time, car rides used to look like this. But nowadays, they look more like this. So how can Volkswagen help bring imagination back to the backseat? By making children curious to look outside again. That's why we created Snelwegsprookjes, location-based audiobooks that bring the highway to life. Welcome by Snelwegsprookjes. See you that thing there? With die draai in the wieken. There, that lijkt wel een startbaan. Laten we tot die tellen. Three, two, one, go! We scanned the entire Dutch highway system to identify thousands of lakes, all kinds of tunnels, windmills, and other landmarks along the road. We turned these ordinary objects into magical characters in our stories. We used an advanced computer visioning system to detect all the objects by camera. It could detect what was next to the highway and what was visible. Kids just need to listen. It is an herd. Gewoon een herd. Kijk. Ai. And let their imagination transform their surroundings. We worked in close collaboration with some of the best children's book writers in the Netherlands, who wrote hundreds of modular chapters, all triggered by objects along the road. Since each journey is different, every story is different as well, creating a unique tale for every possible trip. Daar heb je die stomme meeuw. Ik zie de meeuw! Daar, zie je dat? <laughs> Because no matter where you're going, imagination makes a better ride for everyone. I think a lovely, charming kind of case film there. 
So for me, in summary, it's about experience. It's a new battleground. That brands are co-created with their customers. That those points of inspiration and transaction are now much closer together, not in most instances. That we need to be obsessing about customer expectations. That's, not, that's never been more important. And actually, customers are, in many ways, kind of fickle and brittle. But actually, other categories, like Uber, like your kind of HelloFresh or your kind of subscription kind of services actually has an impact in your category, whether they're in your category or not. And actually, there's a lot of evidence, you know, finance is a great example about where we're all kind of latching onto this and kind of wanting more and more. It's really important to look at that bigger picture and actually think across the whole customer journey. I can rant at you about Gatwick Express versus Heathrow Express, if you like, not now, but it's a great example of the service isn't much different, but the difference is enough for me to not think very highly of Gatwick Express, despite having better branding. Um, and that technology, when used correctly, can liberate your creative thinking. And actually, I would encourage you all to kind of lean in and kind of embrace it, but also be skeptical about it as well in the same breath. So that's me. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you found it interesting. And thank you very much.